Today we've got a great malicious compliance story all about productivity. We'll get into that in a bit, but first, work my hours or we'll find someone who will. So there I was, working at a mid-sized IT firm as a software developer. My team had always been pretty laid back, focusing on results rather than the exact hours we were glued to our desks. Our projects were delivered on time, our clients were happy, and our team morale was high. That is, until we got a new project manager, let's call him Dave. Dave was fresh from a highly regimented corporate background and had ideas about proper workplace management, which basically meant micromanaging everything. He'd schedule unnecessary daily status meetings, demanded we fill out hourly work logs, and insisted that everyone strictly adhere to 9 to 5 office hours with minimal breaks. One day, during one of his infamous efficiency crackdowns, he sent out an email with a new policy that all coding must be done strictly within office hours to ensure collaboration and supervision. This was ridiculous because creative work like coding often requires flexible hours for maximum productivity. But Dave was adamant, and he ended his email with, If you think you can find a loophole, think again. Follow the rules or we'll find someone who will. Challenge accepted, Dave. I decided to comply. Meticulously. I coded strictly between 9am and 5pm, not a minute earlier, not a second later. If I encountered a bug or was in the middle of a complex piece of code, too bad. 5pm means the end no matter what. My teammates, fed up with being treated like school children, followed my lead. The results were predictable. Projects that usually took a couple of weeks started dragging on. Tasks that we could have completed in days with a bit of overtime took much longer because we couldn't capitalize on the bursts of late afternoon productivity we were used to. Our workflow was severely disrupted and the quality of our work started to deteriorate. Dave noticed, of course. He had to answer to upper management for the sudden drop in productivity and lack of commitment, which he knew was a result of our dissatisfaction with his new policy. When upper management called for an impromptu Zoom meeting with the entire at 4.30 p.m. to address the ongoing project delays, the entire team logged in to explain our situation. In the meeting, Dave spent half an hour shifting blame and berating individual team members. He didn't even mention the 9 to 5 policy that had led to the whole situation. As the clock ticked towards 5 p.m., the tension in the virtual room was palpable, and our team hatched a plan over text. Right on cue, as the clock struck 5 p.m., one of the employees spoke up. In compliance with Dave's 9 to 5 rule, we must log off now. Without missing a beat, every team member clicked leave meeting, leaving a stunned Dave to face the executives alone. The abrupt mass exit highlighted the impracticality of Dave's rigid policy, making it clear to the executives that change was necessary. The incident, quickly dubbed as the 5 o'clock Zoom exodus, led to another meeting where Dave was publicly admonished and instructed to abolish his strict rules in favor of more flexibility. And as for me and my team, we made sure to celebrate our little victory with a well-deserved happy hour. After 5 p.m., of course. I get honestly trying to make sure that your workplace has policies for just about everything. Trying to make sure that you're pretty much always on top of every aspect of what your workers may do. But one I would not understand is trying to pressure your workers into this idea of do not ever stick your neck out. Do not ever try to do something a little bit before your work hours or maybe a little bit after. Don't you even dare think you can find a loophole that will allow you to work a little bit harder and a little bit extra for us. How could you not look at a policy like that and understand what kind of culture you're fostering with that? OK Entertainment 4959 wrote, There should be a new rule for all new managers or supervisors. Don't try to fix what's not broken until you've thoroughly understood the current workflow or procedures. Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you guys enjoy awesome stories of malicious compliance, why not hit those like and subscribe buttons down below? That said, our next story is, I'm working my section like you said. About a decade ago, I worked at a well-known bookstore as a seller of books. For anyone not aware, there were sections slash duties that people were assigned to during shifts, and it changed frequently. It wasn't uncommon for shifts or duties to be swapped, relevant later in the story. 
There would have been a recent change in management, and a fresh employee, let's call her Lexa, received a promotion to be an assistant manager despite having limited experience and quite the undeserved chip on her shoulder. Pretty sure she got the job because of her friendship with the departing assistant manager whose position opened up. She was very much a delegator who spent a lot of time hanging out in the back office. I knew Lexa wasn't liked by a few of the veteran employees for the seemingly undeserved promotion. I was a part-timer going to school, so I wasn't interested in moving up or challenging the store leadership. Didn't make much of a difference to me. She and I got along just fine overall and usually exchanged pleasantries with bits of conversation. Until one day. I showed up to work, clocked in, and saw my department was kids. I hated working in kids as it was a Saturday, super packed, and the person who I relieved was terrible at cleaning up whatever section she was assigned to. I called up Lexa and asked her if I could switch with another bookseller who liked working in kids that also just clocked in. Before waiting for an answer, yes, partially my fault, I asked the bookseller if she would be cool switching with me. Lexa, hearing me ask this question, yells over the phone, No! You were assigned to kids, so go to your section! I replied with a simple, Okay. I go to my section, and as expected, it's a disaster. Books on the floor, kids running around, toys strewn about. It was exactly what I anticipated. I got right to work on recovering messed up shelves, making stacks of the books to return to their proper locations, and picked up toys and trash. I was a man on a mission. Wouldn't you know it, but apparently there were some shelves and furniture that needed to be moved around. I get a call on my store phone. It's Lexa, and she needs my help with said task. Mind you, there were enough people on the book floor to help if she also left the back office to get it done. Her tone was much different, and she sweetly asked if I can leave kids to go help with the project. Well, kids is a mess. I was diligently working just to keep up with the unrelenting entropy due to the Saturday afternoon crowd. Could I have helped? Sure. Did I have an excuse not to? Sure did. I firmly replied, sorry, I'm busy in kids. Nothing more, nothing less. The shift ended and we went to go to the break room post shift. Lexa talks to all of us and mentions how we need to remember to work as a team. Her demeanor was mildly sheepish and she avoided making eye contact with me. I sat there, staring right at her with a dumb look on my face, pretending I don't know she's indirectly talking about me. I did find out from a couple of friends she did help out, which required her actually doing some work instead of hiding out. We never had any run-ins after that and she moved a couple of months later. In any case, I worked my assigned section like she told me to. On the bright side, I cleaned up kids and organized it so well that the kids' lead thanked me the next time we worked together. I agree wholeheartedly with Technot. They wrote, Yes, I heard the team really appreciated you coming out of the office to help for the first time. It's just the perfect response. She comes out there and says, We gotta work together as a team. That's the ultimate platform to say, Yeah, I saw you out there helping with the furniture. It was very motivating to see you out there working with the team for once. This next story is, send an internal approval doc to external to approve? Okie doke. Disclaimers, no one will be hurt by the malicious compliance following. The users involved have 20 plus years experience doing the thing and this is a tick and flick document. The document itself is a compliance document taken from a full evidence pack that should only be used in full and only by qualified assessors. This is legislation related to. So a few months ago, as usual, my boss finds a random bit of information that is affecting her KPIs. 30 people don't have box X ticked off because they've been in the company 20 plus years, and X box was only initiated 5 years ago. So she finds an information pack containing all the requirements to get X box ticked, pulls a single assessment page with a clear guide that it's for our team only to sign tells me via email to get all 20 people's external leaders to sign it as evidence. I was very aware that this is not the correct way to do this. It's just the least amount of paperwork. So I did the due diligence and took it sideways to the team next to us who handles stuff like this. Their leader authorizes it without thinking it through. I explained my hesitation. And another leader overhears and also says, if it's in writing, you can action it with a sly smile. She knew what I would do. Light bulb, cue malicious compliance. I sent the entire email chain unedited and pointed out both authorizations. 
attach the piece of assessment and sent it with a list of names to all external leaders from the official shared inbox and not my own. I sent this on day one of my boss going on leave. I had 10 emails sent back in less than 30 minutes refusing to sign it with a big what? They cc'd in all relevant people and pointed out how this breaks compliance regulations. I replied excusing myself from future speculations until a directive from on high came down. Three days later I start to hear rumblings from the big bosses at head office. My boss still isn't back and they would like an urgent meeting to discuss process. Outcome? My team is now required to get approval from the document control team before any external document is sent out. I've happily stopped editing the horrendous documents Big Boss sends me to send out. She doesn't ask for edits, grammar check, etc. I'm simply forwarding them to doc control from shared inbox with her signature still attached. They have been sending everything back, slowing the team down by days at a time per task. Since she didn't explicitly know or ask for me to edit in the past, she didn't know I stopped. Therefore, is very Pikachu face why suddenly her docs are all wrong. Her KPIs are tanking. I think a real issue here OP highlighted is they've been doing a lot of work for this person, beautifying their stuff, to the point where they don't even have a concept of what they're doing wrong. It might even end up reflecting poorly on OP if the big boss says something like, well, for X amount of time now, I've been sending this stuff to OP and it's never been an issue until now. I had no idea about any of these issues, how come all this is happening now? And points out that OP's just been silently refactoring all this work before panning it out. Tarleton wrote, Never, never, never fix a superior's mistakes in a dock after they've handed it off to be delivered and won't see it again. Not only will you be doing invisible work you'll never get credit for, you're also setting yourself up to take the blame for some future problem if it ever comes out. After all, any future error might have been introduced in your unreviewed edits. And if you want a more generous interpretation, not showing people what they're messing up means they keep making the same mistakes forever. Our next story is, manager gets me fired, doesn't realize there's a paper trail. I worked as a writer and editor for over a decade, and in that time I had my fair share of bad bosses, like anyone, but there is one that completely takes the cake. I worked for a large media company that had dealings with a number of other companies and subsidiaries ranging from publishing to fashion to sports to tech. You name it, they did it. How our writing department worked was each writer would have specific areas that they would write for, kind of like how journalists have beats they cover. So if you were assigned to the fashion arm of the company or one of its partners or subsidiaries, you wrote or edited everything for that arm. I worked for this company for about a year and a half before a new manager was hired. She was the second in command of our department. Part of her and our department director's job was to update our internal style guide when necessary. For those that don't know, a style guide is a reference document for how to either refer to things or how to format things for the company or partners. Before her tenure as manager, this was only done maybe once or twice a year, and the changes were relatively minimal since the style guide was very well established in the company and had been in place for a number of years. After she came on, it was being updated at least once a week, if not multiple times a week. It legitimately became an obsession for her. Aside from the general annoyance of keeping up with it, it didn't take long for me and my coworkers to reach the conclusion that our new manager didn't have the faintest idea what she was doing. Each new version had more and more glaring errors. At first, we all ignored these changes, giving her the benefit of the doubt and hoping, albeit naively, that these new directives were mistakes. That was until people started getting reprimanded for not following the style guide. I was the first to get a one-on-one, -on -one, closed-door talk. One of the departments I wrote for was sports, and she had seen that I'd not been following the new rule of how I was to refer to the men's and women's teams I covered. Truthfully, I had willfully ignored it, hoping that it was just a mistake. To my horror, however, it appeared my new writing manager didn't understand basic grammar. You see, the change she implemented removed the apostrophe from men's and women's. So, for example, if I was covering men's basketball, I was to refer to it as men's basketball. Her rationale was that the men didn't own the team, therefore it should not be possessive. Apparently her understanding of the English language didn't evolve past grade school explanations. 
I was honestly pretty dumbfounded at first, but once I got over the initial shock that the second in command of our department didn't realize men's without an apostrophe was not a word, I tried bleakly to explain that men is already plural and that a possessive s doesn't always denote direct ownership. Read men's bathroom. She stared blankly at me for a few seconds, and for the briefest of moments, I thought maybe I was seeing the cogs in her head turn. She, however, doubled down. Realizing the fight was lost, I told her that I would implement the changes going forward. Now, here's where my malicious compliance comes in. We worked for, and with, some very high-profile companies, and mistakes were not tolerated for things that were outward-facing. Realizing her idiocy could cost me my job, I made a simple request. Could you please email me the exact style guide rule you're referencing and how exactly you'd like me to implement it with examples of where I messed up? She looked at me like I was stupid for not understanding what was being asked of me, but she still wrote it all down in an email for me. I also made sure any further style changes were referenced in an email and specifically asked if there were further changes to please cite how I had done them in the past, along with how she would like them to be done from now on. Sure enough, within about six months of this, I was fired. And at my exit interview, I handed HR a folder containing every written communication regarding the style changes, along with quite a bit of evidence that she was passing off her projects to other members of the department and changing people's work behind their back. She was fired three months after me, along with our department director three months after that. Turned out my little folder sparked a full investigation by HR, and after interviewing other co-workers in the department, they realized she had done all of it to have grounds to fire people within the department she didn't like. I just happened to be first on the chopping block. The projects she was passing off to other people, she was taking the credit for what they were doing to make herself look good. Those changes she was making to other people's work? HR realized that she was changing things to make it explicitly incorrect. You gotta love software that tracks changes in timestamps and lists the user. On top of all of this, they also discovered that she had, at best, exaggerated, and at worst, fabricated, large swaths of her resume. By the time she was fired, I'd already found another job in a different department at the same company. It was a good gig, and my new manager wasn't a complete expletive. Eventually, I moved on from that company, but if anything, my time there taught me a very valuable lesson. Document, document, and document some more. Edit to address some questions and things mentioned in the comments. This was around 10 years ago in a US state that has laws that basically state a person can be fired for any reason, provided that it isn't prejudicial. Race, gender, sexual orientation, etc. Writers also aren't exactly top earners. I did well enough to support myself, but legal action would have been difficult to pay for. Not to mention, I was subject to some very strict NDAs because of the company, clients, partners, and subsidiaries I worked for and with. Any legal action would have put me at risk of a countersuit. I was happy that justice was served, and I had a job elsewhere in the company with good pay until I moved on. Edit to... I can't believe the amount of people in my DMs asking if I'm X from Y company. Seriously, how many managers are out there that don't know that men's without an apostrophe isn't a word? Edit 3. If you're trying to document bad practices at your job, your best bet is honestly your phone. In some cases, it isn't against policy to connect your work email to your phone, so screen grab the crap out of everything that is suspect to you. Do not BCC, do not use zip, USB, or thumb drives. Basic software these days can track it and it could result in your firing regardless. Just take a photo of the computer screen with your phone if that's how it needs to be documented. It might not be pretty, and it might look boomer as freak, but if you're trying to cover your butt, this is the easiest, most accessible way. It goes without saying, OP handled this by far the right way. When you know something is ridiculous and ridiculously wrong, just ask for that in writing. Say, listen, I have no problem doing what you're asking me to do, but please confirm to me that you are a moron in writing an email and send it on over to me, thanks. DNA is just neuter to RNA wrote, always ask for the email, and you must take actions to prepare for when they cut your email access. Don't be this guy. My boss is corrupt. I have email proof. Show me the email. I can't. They fired me and cut my email access. Our next story is, you want to put how much concrete in your Civic? 
Many years ago, I worked in a locally run store that sold a bit of everything. I was the low-paid teenager that carried heavy things to people's vehicles. While working one day, I get called over the radio that a customer needed 12 bags of concrete, 80 pounds each. I was expecting to see a pickup truck or something similar backed up to our loading area. Instead, I saw a small Honda Civic there waiting for me. Thinking it was a mistake, I asked the driver to relocate momentarily as I had someone coming to pick up multiple bags of concrete. Imagine my surprise when they told me they were the customer I was waiting for. I asked the customer how much they wanted to take in each trip, as I believed the nearly 1,000 pounds of concrete might be too much for such a small vehicle to handle safely. The customer became aggravated and insisted they were taking it all at once. I quickly ran this past the store owner to make sure I wouldn't be held liable for any damages. I ran back, apologized to the customer, and began loading the bags. As I loaded everything up, the customer made several quips about how the customer is always right and that I was too young and naive to understand that vehicles are engineered with a margin of safety. It quickly became apparent that there was no play left in the suspension, but at this point I just stopped questioning things. I couldn't fit all of the bags in the trunk, so the customer cleared their back seat and I loaded that up as well. Upon leaving the loading area, you could clearly hear things rubbing. As the car went to exit the parking lot, it passed over the elevation change between the lot and the road. There was a loud pop of something breaking, followed by scraping. I could see that the driver was irate in the car. After a moment, they got out, looked around and under their car. The guy sheepishly asked for my cell phone, because his had died and he needed to make a few phone calls. A short time later, a tow truck came to remove the car, and the guy waited in our lot for nearly an hour until his wife could come pick him up. Honestly, I've seen similar things go down. I've seen like an F-250 at Home Depot getting just this huge pallet of concrete blocks put in the back, and you can just see the suspension collapse and that thing becomes a lowrider. I'm just surprised that wherever OP was working, they didn't have a policy that made sure situations like this don't happen. I don't know if places enforce it, but I think I've heard of similar places having some kind of like basic vehicle guide limit. Maybe it's more what you'd call guidelines than actual rules. Our next story is, you want a zero idle time in teams? Okay, we can do that. This story is from a few years ago. It's how I helped my sister and somehow got her company to willingly bypass their own idle time requirements. Her company went work from home after the lockdown and stayed working from home. At first, they required an always-on camera system, but that quickly went away, as the amount of unintended nudity that comes from your average household is quite startling. Then they went with a system that tracks your idle time in Teams. The amount of write-ups, meetings, group meetings, and eventual terminations for what was the dumbest requirement ever caused my sister to ask for help. She sent me an Amazon link for one of those USB sticks that jiggles the mouse. I told her don't use those as even lazy IT can detect them. At the time, Amazon wasn't selling mechanical mouse turners yet, or at least at reasonable prices, so I looked at building one. I found an STL file for this flowery mouse holder, which I modified to be just straight monocolor and 3D printed it. I cut out 1.5 inch circular disc and put it on a weak motor and connected it to a power source through USB. I set the wheel to spin every 1 to 12 seconds for a total of 2 to 5 seconds at a time, but ran into an issue. Sometimes the disc spinning would not actually move the mouse. I found a company that would print stickers at a dollar a sticker if I ordered 5 of them, so I found this basic pattern of squares and lines crisscrossing each other and had it printed to just under the dimensions of the disc. I stuck it on there and the mouse turner worked perfectly. I quickly ran into another issue. Since the disc was raised, it quickly got hung up on the mouse with the sticker. So back into the design I went and made it where the dimensions were slightly larger for the base and set it where the disc would be 2 millimeters below the actual mouse. After printing it, the mouse sat on the cradle and the disc spun without touching. The mouse cursor would randomly just move in weird directions at the time the disc spun. So with that all out of the way, I got a free lunch out of my sister and delivered it. It hooked into her laptop's USB port, never being detected, and would turn her wheel decreasing her idle time down to zero. Within two weeks, she was recognized as a top performer. She was watching crime dramas with her volume at max until she got a notification that a customer submitted a request. 
In other words, her productivity stayed exactly the same. So she calls me up and asks if I can make more of those. Thankfully, I saved the STL files and could order more stickers if needed. I told her I could make each one for 25 bucks. The cheapest on Amazon at the time were like 50, and it only cost me roughly 12 bucks to make them, which went down to 8 bucks to make them at the end. She said several co-workers were asking her about it, and she said she would just give them my number. Within a month, I'd built out 50 mechanical mouse turners, which was kind of a waste as this company only had 32 employees. I miscounted. Sometimes I would meet five or more of her co-workers at a restaurant at the same time, just so I wouldn't have to drive all over DFW. Then one weekend, I get a call from the CEO of that company. See, all of his workers were using these mouse turners, and he wasn't. So when the company published the report on idle times, his was abysmally low. That phone call was one of the most surreal I have ever had. At first, he thought I was one of his employees. I told him I wasn't. I worked for a waste management company. I don't, but I wasn't about to tell him. He asked me about the mouse turners. I told him that I designed them for a friend, but that person no longer worked for the company. Again, lies, I was protecting my sister. Not like he couldn't figure it out, but still. He asked if he could get one. This is where the conversation went very weird. See, I tried convincing him to give up the idle timer requirements. As it clearly wasn't important and only harmed this company, I laid out all of my points for it and pointed out that the CEO of the company is buying a device specifically designed to bypass his requirement. He would not budge. He was so into his company dogma that he just wanted one for me. I already had a few left over, so I told him I could make him one for 35 bucks. Here is the really screwed up part of the story. See, he asked for a full list of my clients, promising that no one would be fired. He just wanted to know how many. I told him that a list would be unnecessary as it's every single one of his employees, literally all 32, excluding him. His response was to have the company reimburse each employee the $25 for the mouse turners and set it up where his company would contact me each time a new employee started. I said I had 10 left over from the initial batch of ones I made and can just give him those and have him contact me when he runs out. He agreed. Well, that kind of never happened as a company on Amazon made what is basically the same thing I was making for like 15 bucks. Theirs is much nicer than mine was too. So a company set idle time requirements which caused issues at the company. Now the company buys devices for each employee so that bypasses the idle timer. Edit, a lot of people keep bringing up PowerShell scripts, analog watches, a weight on your spacebar, or any other device that does it digitally or with regularity. I designed mine to have randomization in it. The reason is simple. IT departments can detect those USB thumbsticks, can detect PowerShell scripts that move your mouse. They have usage reports that show your mouse moved one time each minute exactly on the minute mark. Not every company has these and some don't have anything even close to this, but some do and this device was designed to be as undetectable as possible. One of the guys I gave this to said he had zero work to do until after his lunch break, so what he does is simply log in, set the mouse turner, and go back to sleep. He has his volume at full blast right by his ear so if he gets a team message, it wakes him up. If I were one of those employees, I would love OP and I would absolutely pay 25 even 35 bucks for a device like that. That said, and it doesn't take me pointing it out, but it's ridiculous that this company's like, somehow okay making these idle mouse turners part of their standard workflow? I guess in a roundabout way, it ensures that you are kind of actively monitoring it. It's not really like you can click off the screen and go watch YouTube or something. You do kind of have to just leave your computer there with the mouse randomly moving around every so often on whatever team software. G. Brun wrote, he's possibly made a mistake and got a contract with a firm that does the tracking where he gets screwed if he cancels. This is possibly his malicious compliance too. LP replied, possibly. I know he uses outside IT for his IT needs. Our next story is closing time. I was working a closing shift at McDonald's and at the end of the night, this night in particular, I was in grill. It was getting late and we were slow. So I started minimizing what we had in stock and was going to cook the rest of the food to order for the last half hour of my shift. The closing manager came up to the table to see what I had and told me to fill the trays because we aren't closed yet. 
I tried to explain to her what I was doing and she didn't listen to a word I said, so I did what she asked. I turned back on the second heated cabinet and told the person I was in grill with to do what she said and fill the trays. He looked at me confused and I told him that she wanted the trays full. She can deal with the waste at the end of the night. So that's what we did. We filled the trays up with food as if it were lunch rush since that's what she wanted. At the end of the night, I emptied out all the full trays into a bucket and gave it to her with her sheet to fill out with how much waste we had and she tried to make me count it. I told her, I am not closing manager, it is your job to count it, have fun, and finished closing down the grill. Oh, she was ticked. The next day, my GM asked what happened and I told her. All she said was never to do it again. I never worked a closing shift with that manager after that. What OP was planning on doing, to me, seemed like pretty common sense towards the end of the night. I mean, orders are probably going to be fewer. I mean, really, I don't know what that closing manager expected to happen. Marino311 wrote, Nothing like getting hoist by your own petard. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another awesome malicious compliance story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.